My name is Dr. Alice Jackson. I'm a clinical research fellow at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And I have um, been discussing today an analysis of diuretic use in the DAPA-HF trial, which we presented recently at the, H the ESC HFA discovery session. The DAPA-HF trial was a randomized control trial of the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor dapagliflozin versus placebo in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, both with and without diabetes. 4,744 patients were randomized, and these were patients with New York Heart Association class 2, 3, or 4 heart failure, a left ventricular ejection fraction of 40% or less, and an elevated natriuretic peptide level. The primary outcome of the trial was a composite of a worsening heart failure event or death from cardiovascular causes. And after a median follow-up of about 18 months, there was a 26% reduction in the risk of the primary outcome with dapagliflozin compared with placebo, with event rates for all three components of the primary outcome favouring dapagliflozin. Dapagliflozin was well tolerated and safety outcomes were similar between the randomized groups. And importantly, the benefit of dapagliflozin was consistent in patients with and without diabetes. We know that inhibition of SGLT2 in the proximal convoluted renal tubule leads to natriuresis, increased urinary glucose and consequently water loss. We also know that 84% of patients in the DAPA-HF trial were taking a conventional diuretic at baseline. However, not much is known about the effects of adding an SGLT2 inhibitor to conventional diuretics in patients with HEFREF. So we felt that understanding the interaction between these groups of drugs would be of fundamental importance to the use of dapagliflozin in patients with HEFREF. So with that in mind, we examined the efficacy and safety of dapagliflozin according to baseline diuretic therapy and also across baseline diuretic doses. And we then also examined changes in diuretic requirement and other markers of interest over time, such as hematocrit, systolic blood pressure and creatinine. With respect to DAPA-HF, it was a randomized control trial of dapagliflozin 10 milligrams once daily versus placebo in patients with HEFREF, and patients were randomized on the basis of a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes or no type 2 diabetes, so stratified on the basis of their diabetic status. And in this analysis, we stratified patients according to whether they were taking a conventional diuretic at baseline or not, and then across the diuretic dose groups. So we calculated a fruzamide equivalent loop diuretic dose in all patients. We excluded 128 patients in whom the loop diuretic dose at baseline was indeterminate. So the final cohort we analyzed in this study was uh, comprised 4,616 patients. And we categorized patients into four groups according to their baseline dose. So one, those on no diuretic, two, those on less than 40 milligrams fruzamide equivalent diuretic, three, those on exactly 40 milligrams fruzamide equivalent diuretic, and four, those on greater than 40 milligrams fruzamide equivalent diuretic. And patients on a non-loop diuretic only, so most commonly a thiazide diuretic, were included in the low dose group, the group, the group on less than 40 milligrams. We found notable differences in patient characteristics across the diuretic categories compared to patients on no diuretics. Those on the highest diuretic doses were younger, had higher natriuretic peptide levels, worse symptoms, a lower left ventricular ejection fraction, worse renal function, and more often had had a prior heart failure hospitalization, atrial fibrillation, or diabetes. We found that the mean dose of loop diuretic in the trial was 60 milligrams overall and was similar in both randomized groups. And although a reduction in dose was more common with dapagliflozin than with placebo, the majority of patients in the trial did not change their diuretic dose during follow-up. We also found that the benefit of dapagliflozin persisted irrespective of diuretic use or dose. Um, we found that combining uh, dapagliflozin with conventional diuretics was safe. There was slightly more volume depletion in patients taking dapagliflozin and diuretics, but importantly, this did not lead to uh, increased frequency of drug discontinuation or of renal adverse events. 
And finally, we found a sustained elevation in hematocrit with dapagliflozin across all diuretic dose categories. And this persisted even despite a reduction in diuretic dose at six and 12 months. Well, we still don't fully understand how SGLT2 inhibitors exert their benefit in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. One suggestion is their diuretic effect. In this study, we found that combining dapagliflozin with conventional diuretics did not have a major impact on the use of diuretics in the majority of patients, and nor was there a clear diuretic dose effect with respect to the benefit of dapagliflozin. These findings don't preclude a diuretic effect or a potential benefit related to that, but there are certainly some signals from this study of other potential mechanisms of action that may be contributing. And in particular, our findings do suggest that factors other than hemoconcentration might account for the elevation in hematocrit seen with dapagliflozin. And there is some evidence from other studies showing that treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors results in an increase in erythropoietin levels but certainly more research is, is needed in this area. The main take home message from, from this study is that we found most patients do not change their diuretic dose after starting dapagliflozin and that the drug remains safe and effective irrespective of diuretic use or of diuretic dose. And this is important clinically when looking after patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction who may be on both an SGLT2 inhibitor and a conventional diuretic.